Hello, I'm Lauren and welcome to Improving the World. I'm an international improviser based in Hong Kong and I speak with amazing women of improv all over the world. Today, I talked to Kaisa Coco Palmer. She is a Finnish improviser based in Helsinki and we talk about the fact that she has founded two improv schools. She has gone over the bumps so you don't have to. If you're interested in founding a school, attending a school, improv generally, or hearing from a really nifty person, this video is for you. I hope that you enjoy. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. And thank you for having me. How are you? I'm so happy to. Yeah, I'm really good. So you are the founder of Impro Helsinki and you're an improviser, of course, yourself. And so we are going to talk today about founding an improv school, which you have done twice. Hence the construction, because you're like a constructing expert, apparently, I've decided. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the things that's fantastic, maybe sad, I don't know, um, opportunity about the Finnish scene is that a lot of people use improv maybe as a jumping off point for other things, or improv has been seen as a skill for other stuff. So how do you convince people that they need improv? improv classes if they feel like it's kind of only part of something else and not its own standalone part. I do think that at this point it is its mm. own, but I think that from the history of it, when it comes from the perspective of theater training, for example, it has been a tool, if you will. Still, I would say that that is one of the things that you need to think about how to convince people who don't have the experience of that training to be part of it. One of the key elements, of course, for people is to see impro, to be able to see what it can be. But in addition to that, I think that I am a little bit of like this traveling agency. Have you ever been to improv? <laughs> you know, <laughs> giving the people maybe those words from the genuine point of view, I feel like what are the things that will make their life better if they do impro classes? The combination of seeing what it is and what it could be, in addition to improvisational theater being something that is from the perspective of audience member can be like surprising, super fun, emotional. It also shows collaboration in one of its purest forms. That's always some sort of a point when talking with people. Do you see that those folks are just doing something really, really special together and then kind of going from there or starting from there. I love that you've just described yourself as basically the used car salesperson. You're like this charismatic, slick, Ponzi scheme selling <laughs> individual. You understand and identify, we need this. This is something, I love it. It's going to help people. It's not just a tool. It can be its own standalone thing. Why should somebody attend improv classes? Okay, collaboration, great. So it's still maybe a skill or something. Why should they not just take one, but why should they take a series? Why should they take classes and come to the school and spend some time and try this, really try it? It will transform their lives. Uh, it will, it will. It's an interesting thing because you start first with the main and the core ideas in Impro are collaboration, communication, and listening, acceptance. It first starts from tiny little things that you try out and you get the courage of doing different kind of exercises, for example, and slowly it starts to kind of leak into other parts of your life as well. And you can see what happens, of course, for a performative perspective and you get the courage to go on stage and you get to get all of those experiences for yourself. Even more so, you start to learn to recognize situations in your life where you're like this how I cope with this or how I was curious about this or how I went over judgment in this is because of these improv classes so it's slowly if you keep with it it will slowly transform the way you look at life and it makes the world a better place this is a big thing that I'm claiming, but I honestly do believe in that and I also see that in the students that I've gotten to work with when they are staying with us one big part of the classes that we offer is also the self-reflection and feedback in different ways now not only when it comes to the actual art or the craft of it, but also how does this affect me as a human? That's the reason why you should keep with it as well. I'm sold. I'm ready to sign up for classes. Okay, so you decided, I love this. People need this. Basically, I'm going to fix the world. I'm going to start this improv school. The first one, we've all taken classes and maybe you've taught classes, but unless you've been given curriculum and you've taught that and then you can like take it with you, how did you figure out which curriculum to create and how to make something that was a standardized experience? So it's very different to take a drop-in versus offering a series. And then if someone takes it again or someone else takes it, giving something that's the same, how did you do that and create that? 
Well, my background is in education. So I've studied education and I'm a teacher by one of my professions. To me, I think one of the big things that comes to this, in addition to content, is the pedagogical point of view. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is one of the biggest things when constructing a curriculum. What are the things that we're going to aim for? And to me, of course, it comes from what have I learned before and what is my philosophy on improv at the moment of course it's also ever changing which is a cool thing as well as like I am not a ready teacher for example ever I'm not a ready improviser at any point but the way the first curriculum was constructed for example with another teacher who also had her background in teaching mm -hmm. and then were both improvisers for a long time studied impro in many different places mm -hmm. also slowly started to teach teaching impro and doing workshops doing series of things going to different companies and teaching for a, a certain amount of time so so when it came to constructing the curriculum, it was mainly about the idea of how do you teach all in all, offering a platform where you have the safety to try mm -hmm. out different things. And that is one of the most important portions before you even go to any of the content. How do you create the kind of space where people have the possibility to go into something and honestly, truthfully learn and not feel too scared or too bad about themselves, still having the possibility to get feedback and give it to each other and slowly become better I was I don't know if better is the right word but not, be, become more experienced in improv then that connected to the content that would be let's say if you're talking about standardized standardized is that a word yeah yeah it is, it is now yeah no, but it is Oh, so, for example, you think of like, this is our level one. What happens during this level one? What are the goals that we have? What would we like for the students to be able to know or have experience of by the end of this? And then think about how we get there. I think it's important for an improv teacher to have a point of view, quite a clear point of view, what they can offer instead of trying to offer everything, because then it's kind of like, you know, but at the same time being like, this is one way of doing things, being very clear about back to your students as well and be like go and learn with many different teachers and many different styles and all of that so that they can get as much access as ever they want to that's what I would think how it originally happened. You said at the beginning of that, it felt important to create a space where people could, my word's not yours, but like sort of trial and error. Were you talking about just the students, this ability to kind of try and grow or also the teachers? Because I guess if you're starting a school and you're teaching and other people are teaching and you've taught before, but you've not done this before, there's also going to be trial and error for yourselves. Do you mean that mm -hmm. as well? Oh, absolutely. And I think that that's one of the things in name pro is we can become very experienced and we can become very skilled improvisers. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that this whole art form is based on the idea of we don't know. And that I think is beautiful. After so many years, people who have been doing it for a really long time, they have their ups and downs. And that mm -hmm. is the wonderful thing about it. If we can be honest, and I very much believe in this, not only in the world of improv, but in the world of education and teaching all in all, if the teachers can be honest about where they're at and about the fact that they don't know everything or they don't try to hide their own insecurities that is the best gift that you can give to your students when they see that you are also learning and you're also failing because that's the whole point of improvisation on its yeah. own because it's not really a thing it's a way of doing things improvisation if you think of it is not a thing it's a way to do something or a way to get somewhere and you don't even know where you're going to get so it's kind of a cool thing of trying different things out yeah. so in in that way, I think it's super important hmm. that you give this example and give yourself the permission as well. And I don't mean going into things being like, I have no idea, let's try something out. And people are paying for that. Of course, you have the responsibility, but within that framework to give the possibility of honesty hmm. and always. And I think that also sounds healthy. It's real. It's mm -hmm. not got a plastic shiny cover. I'm from California, so let's just say spray tan, right? It's not like a spray tan of <laughs> shiny, shiny. I had to throw in a California reference. So you're <laughs> creating your curriculum, you're getting ready, you're gonna open this school. How did you find, and I truly need to know this because I think globally, everywhere I've lived, maybe it's where I'm choosing to live, but it's expensive for space. You gotta market and you gotta get people. How did you get funding, support, and space? How did you literally get a place? 
Well, it is the same here as well, especially if it is for a space that is bigger. If the idea is to also use it as a performative space, that's a completely different discussion altogether. We started very small. We rented a very small, like a living room size, small little space. Literally what happened was I was riding my bike into the city. <laughs> city town center let me say i had been looking for different spaces for some time already because the company that i was with at the time we were trying to find a space where we could also do other work an office space if you will i saw just this small little paper on a window and i was like what's that and then i stopped and i went to read we are like, uh, renting out these small rooms and i was like could we do it in such a small room because it is it's like possible it's not like it's affordable at this point point. and then i introduced it to my colleagues at the time and they were like okay let's do it and so so we got into this very, very small, small little tiny thing. And that's where we started from. I believe absolutely that it has a lot to do with the overall picture of what kind of space you have, all of that. As the key or the main arrowhead of everything is the product mm -hmm. that you're offering. So mm -hmm. if you are giving people a good experience, they get what they came to get with the money that they invest, or maybe they get even more. That is so much more important, especially I think that in the beginning of doing stuff instead of being like well I'm gonna make this amazing castle full of like whoa whatever tactics and technical stuff and then people come and you're like I don't really know what to offer then we're approaching it the wrong way around of course the best possibility would be that you have the means and you have the possibility to go with that and apply for funding which of course also it depends on the country how you can do it in Finland there are possibilities to apply for different kind of grants and that is something that I have done in the past as well and this month we have gotten. We're still growing. The info is on its modern form, quite a new thing still in Finland. One of the things that we're trying to work with is to introduce it as a standing art form of its own as well. And especially when it comes to funding arts, so that it would be there in the company of the other forms of art, so that the decision makers would be like, yeah, we're going to invest into this. And slowly it is also going towards that direction. That makes me very happy. <laughs> I also need to bring up two things that you said because they were very exciting. I love what you said about exceeding expectations because I've taught in the basement of a barber before. I've been in the, <laughs> the whitewashed small downstairs underneath a barber teaching. I've had people come and be like, oh my God, am I going to be murdered today? And then they leave going, wow, that was so great. <laughs> Thanks. But the point is, I set expectations appropriately, exceeded them. And so to the counterpoint you had, which I also adore, you don't need an improv castle. Although, can I tell you, as soon as you said that, I saw the improv <laughs> castle. There's a bouncy, there's a trampoline in the back, there's a slide yes. to get down the stairs, mm -hmm. a bubblegum ceiling. I see the improv castle. But I think that's a really important point. And coming back to the shiny, shiny, that feels less important than the content, the true fibrous core of what you're offering. And then if you can put shiny on top, okay, but first let's make sure that we have really solid stuff. Yeah. I really hear that. Therefore, I ask you, is passion enough? All you got is passion and all you can afford is a creepy basement under a barber. If someone is listening to this and they're like, I'm passionate too, I wanna start an improv school. Is that enough? Because you've done this twice now. What do they need to think about? The business side, the marketing, what are some key things? Is the passion gonna fuel it all or do they need to make sure they pay attention to a few things? Yeah, I think that is a very good question. And I think that it's very important to think about why you're starting this in school. I think that is one of the main things. If it is like, I want to make money somehow, don't start an improv school. Start doing something completely like go like all in all, like it can. <laughs> Run in the opposite direction. <laughs> It can, of course, become successful. And that is one of the things, of course, as a business owner now, I want my school to run in a way that it provides for me and for other people as well. Mm. But that's not the main point. And then you have to think about why you are starting the school. And secondly, when you get it together, when you know what are the points why you are doing this, then think about how to approach it. Remember that you have other things in life as well than only the school. In the beginning, especially, I think that it will take a lot of time of course and it will take a lot of effort but remember to take good care of yourself because you're the most important person of your own life so if you don't take good care of yourself you don't have enough to offer 
for other people. And that can be a big thing when it comes to running a school in this case. And then, of course, all the technical things. Where do you do it? How do you do it? When do you do it? How will you get paid? How do you market? Who are you marketing it to? What if people don't come? All of those kind of things. And this coming from someone who now have been doing work with these different schools for the last five or so years. We just finished our logo last week. <laughs> So if you think about it from the perspective of like what to do first and what next, the passion has also driven me towards those things. Of course, from my perspective, the most important ones, but it is very good mm. to have someone or some other people to talk things with and give you the other perspectives and also the outsider's perspectives. And from the beginning, also ask from people who don't know impro at all, who are not in that world yet, to ask them, what does this seem like? And what is the message of this? What do you get out of this when it's like uh, whatever you're marketing or what the space is or what the content is or whatever so that you get enough feedback and enough of different kind of perspectives on what your product in this case or what the school is going to be. And you're making me think of two other things, getting feedback. It's funny because I think that there'll be a lot of feedback when someone's going in on a new venture, maybe solicited and some unsolicited. And I think as well, at least me personally, if I'll throw in my two cents, as much as I ask for feedback, I also need to put it through my filter and what I know is my driving force and reasonings. A lot of the feedback is so valuable and especially if you hear something a bunch of times, but also if I listen to every piece of feedback, I would lose my mind. Also, I wouldn't maybe do what I wanted to do mm -hmm. and execute my vision. But hearing people, you're so right, who are outside of this genre give thoughts, I totally agree, so helpful and also, they only know what they know. They don't know what I know. So hearing that, sieving it through, and then taking what works and car parking the rest, I find for me is a really valuable experience. Absolutely. And I think, like as I was saying in the beginning, first you need to think of what is your philosophy on impro and what are you going to bring? And so then after that, you have a certain way of looking at things and you're kind of like, at this moment, at least this is my way and my way of being able to give things to the community or out or for the school or whatever, and then filter the things that you need feedback on through that. Absolutely. Because if you are aimless or if you're being affected by everything that has been said, yeah. it's going to be too hard. So I completely <laughs> agree with you on that. And also, sorry for cutting you off. I think that you were still continuing. So well, I will literally never shut up, hence why I have a freaking YouTube channel. It's totally <laughs> fine. Yes, I did have one other thing, but it's bouncing off of what you said. I was listening to this great podcast called How I Built This, and it's about people founding things. And it's a gentleman who founded the Samuel Adams beer. I don't drink beer. It's not about that. He was talking about how when they first started, he didn't get a phone because he just didn't think there was value in getting like a phone and a phone line. And this is years ago when everyone had, you, know, you had to have a business, you had to have a phone. And he didn't even start a brewery. He didn't have a brewery because he kind of did the math and figured out the goals and he didn't need to have a physical space or phones. And so instead he would go and rent a brewery for however many hours, brew his beer and sell it. And they got a phone later. So to your point about your logo what is most key and crucial and important and drive that and make that successful and when it's time get the phone get the logo get the space whatever if that's not what you have to have and you're trying to be financially viable don't do it yet you know so I think there's a lot of wisdom in that you started a second improv school so you did the first one, you made your curriculum, mm -hmm. you got your students, you got going. Then you came to Helsinki. So the first one was not in Helsinki. We've already touched on a few, but are there any top learnings when you did it the second time around where you went, ha ha, this time I'll make sure that I, whatever. Be more patient. Okay. <laughs> But I don't know if I actually have learned that yet very well. But I reckon when I start my third April school, no. The fourth one, I don't the fourth one, yeah. Okay. Yes. When the seventh one comes around, I'm ready for it. <laughs> I think that for me, it was mainly, I have done this once. It's possible to do it again. To underline the idea, I didn't do anything on my own. Yes, some of the things I have done, I have been the main person at some point. But there's always support, whether it is with colleagues, 
colleagues or whether it is with other people who are doing this all around the world, being able to reach out and talk about things or think about things both ways, giving the support to others if that's something that can be done. Finland is a small country. Impro is relatively small and new, even though it has skyrocketed. It's like when mushrooms are being born at uh, rain time, you know, that's a Finnish expression. I don't know if you have it in English or not, but anyways. I so these. I love it. <laughs> So these mushrooms are popping up like this improv, like, so there's so much more improv right now. It keeps on growing. The idea of opening an improv school that is specifically for improvisational theater, because there are theater schools a lot in this country is when it has been done once, going to a different city, the belief in the fact that it is possible to do that again, then reminding yourself not everything is going to happen like this. For the second round, I want to say that I was more patient with being able to construct some sort of a timeline, because for the first one it was just like let's get this going let's create a curriculum let's can we open up can we do the first classes already in like three weeks now and so this time around let's think about what can be achieved in which time and not trying to do everything at the same time for example now we've been running for almost two years now we're slowly starting to go towards the direction of getting people who have been with us for the time have learned a lot of things and now maybe they can start house teams slowly starting to be able to build the kind of community in which we have performers that come out of our school and then that is the part that we haven't even touched upon so far because you cannot do everything at once that probably is the biggest learning point from the first time around what totally shocked you surprised you what went horribly wrong Did you just fall on your face at all well, of course, given the circumstances of this time that we're in right now, with Impro Helsinki, we have around 110 students coming to weekly classes, which we're really happy about. Things are looking up. We're like creating new things. We're learning, thinking about the ensemble, one year conservatory training, all of these things. And then everything is closed. Everything shuts down and we're like, of course, firstly, how can we keep as many people healthy and safe as possible? Then secondly, what are we going to do? It was never in my way of thinking. There's no way of preparing for something like this. And all of a sudden it's like, yeah, you're done. We're still a relatively new company. And also the school here in Helsinki, not that many people still know about us. So marketing is one thing of, uh, and thinking about how you, I'm jumping off to some other part now, but how you get people to know about your school. And one of the good things that when it refers to the idea, when you that if you're giving a really good experience to people, exceeding their expectations, they will tell other folks. And I think that that's one of the really, really important factors yeah. when it comes to... Anyways, I have talked with a lot of improvisers and a lot of improv schools lately, and they are all in the same situation. So you can't do the things that you've always done before. And now you're in a week changing your curriculum. You're bringing things into Zoom. Those folks are making good money out of this situation. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that has been one of the biggest challenges mm -hmm. so far from a financial point of view. Oh my goodness, there has been for sure the, will I be able to pay my own <laughs> this month? Mm -hmm. Those kind of things. But I can't remember anything off the back that would be like, that was absolutely yeah. horrendous. Good. Let it stay that way, please. <laughs> for you and my own curiosity, because I'm nosy, and also people out there who are teachers, how do you as the school find good teachers? Should teachers approach you? Do you advertise? Do you stalk them on the internet and find them and pull them out of the black hole of the internet? How do you match each other? For the first time around, during the time that I was actively part of that school, we were only two teachers and we knew each other from before. We talked a lot about our philosophies and we talked a lot about what we bring in. That was enough teachers for the time. Then when I was leaving, we would replace me and we, of course, knew a lot of the people. We knew basically all the improv people of that town already. Mm -hmm. And so then we had interviews and we talked with several different people and then we ended up with two that would most match the philosophy and the ideology and and how they were teaching. When you are choosing new improvisers to be in your class, for example, maybe it has a little bit of a different approach to it because I feel like people can learn a lot. People can learn to be very good performers. The most important thing is how does that person fit this ensemble, for example. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to picking a teacher, it is very important that they are having the similar kind of thoughts on improvisation when it comes to you representing this school and that they have the amount of experience as a teacher. They have the skills 
skills as an actual educator to me is important. But then in addition to that, they have to have their own way. There's no reason of cloning one person and having 10 of them and teach exactly the same way, but that they have their own way of looking at it. I try to make a comparison between when you're looking for an improviser and when you're looking for a teacher. So I think that for an improviser, it's even more important that they fit the ensemble. As a teacher, it's important that you fit the school's ideology, but at the same time that you are a teacher and you want to be teaching, whatever that then means. It's another conversation altogether. And I've heard you say, bring your uniqueness and bring your perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear that. If you could talk to the younger version of you, your mm. improv community peers, be they wanting to start a school or otherwise, or people who've never tried improv and they see this video and they're like, hang on a minute, I'm in Helsinki, I want to come be educated. What do you want to say to them? What are your words of wisdom? First of all, everyone is invited. That is the most amazing thing to me about improvisation. When I am in the world outside of improv, I tend to gravitate towards the people who are like me. Of course, my friends, my family, well, I have to be with them in any I love my family, don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, and <laughs> when I'm very different from someone, we might not cross paths for longer than just for the necessity of it. When I'm in an improv class, I find when there are people who are like me, I get along with them really well. Oh, we get to go on this adventure together on stage. We're like, oh, we're like thinking the same mind. When I'm with someone who is very different from me, instead of being like, nah, I don't really, I'm not going to be in touch with them. Curiosity over judgment becomes the thing. And I get to learn the kind of things with these people that I would never get to learn with the folks who are similar to me. Everyone is being invited. So if you are listening to this and you're like, is this for me? It is for everyone. <laughs> So that's the really, really wonderful, cool thing about it. The second thing is if you're thinking about starting an impro school, great. First of all, that's a wonderful thing to think about. As I said already, think why. Why are you putting it together? Why are you finding it? Think about what are the things that you can give to it? And what are the things that maybe somebody else should help you with? Then go for it and be brave. And remember that. It's easier said than done. And I feel like I've been doing this for a relatively long time already. And I still feel bad about failing. So mm -hmm. it's easier to say like, don't worry. In the same way as you're being kind to other people and which Impro also teaches you to do, empathy and listening and being kind to others. Also be that to yourself and mm -hmm. say that it's okay to also not do it in a certain way or not being certain place at a certain time. Give yourself the, you know, good old hug and pat in the back. Have a day off, take good care of yourself as well. Yeah, I like that. Okay, finally, people are passing through Helsinki. They want to take a class, see a show. They want to buy you a Helsinki long drink or they, they want to buy <laughs> you a fresh. <laughs> really salty licorice. How can people find you? Come knock on your door. You live at number 5A Helsinki Street. How can they find exactly. you? Exactly. It's actually really funny that I do live on Helsinki Street. That's uh -huh. the name of our street. <laughs> But in addition to that, just go to Helsinki Street and shout. Hey, yeah. The name of our school is Impro Helsinki, and you can find that both on Facebook and on Instagram. Our website is improhelsinki.com. Those are very good ways of finding us and letting us know that you're there and you want to get involved. We would love to have you. Brilliant. Thank you so very much. It was lovely getting to talk to you, and I really appreciate your time and your energy. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking me and having this conversation and doing what you do. I'm really, really happy to be here. My love to Helsinki and you, and thank you all for watching. This is Improving the World. I'm Lauren, and there is more where that came from. Bye, all. So, did you love the video? If you did, please say kind and wonderful things in the comments down below, and you could subscribe if you're feeling sassy, and look for more Improving the World.